All right, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Long night last night. Uh, so when Oscar asked me to do a talk about um, subject of my choice, one of the things that I feel is the most under-discussed practice of bone size, the repotting process. Because everybody wants to focus on the manipulation, the sculpting, the big bends, the fantastic things that we can do in the styling of the foliar mass, which is beautiful because you get an immediate payoff. Right? You bend it, and it looks different, and you say, ah, we have now done bonsai. But when we actually think about what makes a bonsai a bonsai, as opposed to just a plant in a pot, it's this really confined environment of this shallow tray. And inside of that, that means that the biggest part of what we do is not all of the heavy bending and wiring and everything on the canopy. It's how we handle this root system that dictates the success of our operations in bonsai. And and yet it's the most misunderstood, I think it's the most maybe mispracticed, whether it's the application of soils, types of soils, particle sizes that we utilize in bonsai, whether it's the way that we water it, whether it's the technique that we apply when we perform the repotting operation. So this has been kind of at the epicenter, the, the center point of what we've tried to focus on at Mirai, which is how do we set this tree up to be able to have success with all the radical things that we want to do to the foliar mass and the branching systems of the tree. And that's been the backbone largely of what we've been able to accomplish. And uh, the photo of the tree on the screen is a, a testament to that, right? A, last year's tree that we did a demonstration on, also a testament to that. The big question is, is that going to live? And it's like, oh, not only is it going to live, it's going to thrive. Right? And now, now, one year later, we actually see, oh, wow, he wasn't lying. It, it, it did live. But in order to make that happen, you have to have a strategy. And you have to have a system by which, just the same as when we style the canopy of a tree, you have to have a system by which you approach design. Right? It's not something that we can sort of approach with a fly by the seat of our pants or sort of a willy-nilly or an unorganized nature to accomplish the very best aesthetic. Well, if we're going to have a tree survive the most significant operation that it's going to experience as a bonsai, we need to have a strategy and a system in place. So I wanted to share my strategy with you guys this morning, just to shed, shed some light on how do I go about, in a radical angle change like this, transitioning this tree from this container to a container that, number one, has the tree survive, which I don't think should ever be a question, but number two, looks as, always, as though it always grew that way. This is the most important thing, that it looks believable when we finish that operation, okay? So I'm gonna walk you, walk you through the general transition, right? Now, number one, when you start to repot a tree and you start to form your ethos or your belief system around repotting, you have to understand what your goal is in the repotting process, okay? My goal when I'm repotting a tree is to get that tree into an appropriately sized container, not just a transitional container. I want to put that tree in the ideal size container that it will always grow in. And here's why, okay? Because there's different strategies and some people think this is super aggressive. If you have the correct technique, you can heavily reduce a root system and have a lot of success in the repotting process. And I want to take that operation of the repotting process and go into the container to cultivate roots that that tree is going to have from the moment I repot for the rest of its life. Okay? So if you think about the process of repotting and I take this tree and I put it in a, in a, 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 a slightly too large of a container and then three, four, five years later I'm going to repot it again into a slightly smaller container, you're going to be growing roots in that middle container that you're then going to be cutting off when you put it into that smaller container. But if you have the appropriate technique, you can go from that container that it's in to the container you ideally want it to be in, in one single go, and then every root that you build will contribute to that tree for the rest of its life. I like this strategy. I like this plan. I don't want an intermediate step that I'm going to grow something that I'm then going to cut off. This doesn't make any sense to me. Okay? So my goal inside of repotting is to go into an appropriately sized container for that tree's life as a bonsai. Okay? Now, knowing that, that, that singular piece, knowing this, sets up all of my strategy now. Because if I have a different strategy, right? If my focus is on getting rid of the field soil, for instance, this is a big 
focal point for a lot of people in repotting. I'm going to get rid of the field soil. This isn't my focus, okay? Because if that was my focus, then it doesn't matter what size of container I put it in. Does that make sense? So now you start to see, oh, okay, identifying what your focus is is what helps you set your strategy, okay? So I'm trying to get it into an appropriately sized container. This is my goal. I want to cultivate roots for the rest of that tree's life the first time I repot it, okay? Now, in order to do that, what this means is I have to formulate some rules because it shouldn't be a question of whether the tree is going to survive or not. That should never be the question in mind when we repot. It should always be expected that the tree will survive. It's just a matter of how rapidly is it going to recover from this operation. That becomes the question at hand, okay? In order to ensure survival, I've got two major rules that I follow every time I repot a tree. Number one, I never bear root. Number two, I always leave some portion untouched. Okay, now, those seem like the same thing. Never bear root, yeah, okay, sounds good. Always leave some portion untouched. Okay, aren't those the same thing? Not necessarily, not necessarily. Because an undisturbed portion of the root mass is what gives that tree the capacity to endure the repotting process. So when we think about, well, if there's still some soil clinging to the roots, then we technically didn't bear root. But if we've broken up the entire root mass, we've definitely disturbed every portion of it. That is a tree that has the chance to die. So leaving that portion that hasn't been touched, it maintains all of the biology in the container, all of those fungi and bacterial relationships that our conifers depend on to survive. And it allows the tree a main epicenter of root mass to produce new roots after the repotting operation. This is extremely important for the success when we start to change a tree's root mass in the practice of bonsai, okay? I'm trying to go into a container that's appropriate for the tree. I'm never bare rooting. I always leave some portion untouched. And now this allows me to walk down the process of a tree like this because I've established that strategy for this operation. I have that in my mind. The entire time I'm repotting, this is always in my mind, okay? So if I were going to repot this tree and I wanna make sure to get it into the appropriate size container, but I can't bear root it and some portion has to remain untouched, I better now develop my strategy around, oh, I can't just pull this out and start taking soil off the roots and think later about what I need to do to get it into that appropriately sized container. I need to think now about what I'm gonna do. So when we start to look at this, there's two areas on this tree that form significant limitations to getting it into a container of the appropriate size. Where are those areas? If I asked you that, I said, tell me, tell me what is limiting this. What do you got? From the left here? Okay, okay, so from the left, right, we want to push up to that, that's good, it's keen. Anybody else? The top, the top, this sticking way up, right? This is a major limitation, okay? And what about, what about the bottom? Is the bottom a limitation? Good, the container might be higher up. Now here's where we have to have this next step, this next piece of knowledge, because we've already designed the tree. So we know what angle it's gonna sit at, we know what positions it, it, it's at, but what we have to do is formulate the concept for the container as well. Because when we start to think about the container, this tree could potentially sit in a slightly deeper container that gives it the physical mass to anchor the asymmetry. If that's the case, this depth from this point to this point might not be a limitation, right? So when I look at this and I'm trying to decide my strategy, is my biggest limitation here or here? Confirming that by the container I'm gonna be putting it in is what allows me to decide, and I need to decide. Because what if I have to do so much work here that the only portion that's untouched and not bare rooted is down here? That has to work with the container that I've chosen. And I'm gonna say for this tree to anchor that asymmetry, I can handle a slightly deeper container, so that means that this upper portion is my number one area of concern. Now I know, now I know. That makes it so easy, because think about this. You free the roots from the side of this container, you remove the tree from the container, and now you know exactly where you start the repotting process. We can't bear root, some portion has to stay untouched, it's going into the container that we've determined is appropriate for its size, cool. I'm not gonna touch any other portion of this root mass except for this upper portion that I need to reduce as the limitation of the tree. And what that means is, I can be quite aggressive with this portion of the root mass. I can't be completely careless, right? Because there are obviously significant roots that exist here. But I can be aggressive. I can be confident. 
knowing that I have analyzed, I have developed a strategy around it, and now I have my protocol for the step-by-step -step process. I'm gonna reduce this. I'm gonna reduce it as far as I can. Ideally, I would reduce this height down to this point right here. What does that allow me to do? It allows me to establish a new surface, height for the tree's root system that aesthetically maximizes what I've set out to accomplish by, again, choosing a container that pulls this deadwood into the base. Did everybody see the demo yesterday? If you didn't see the demo, you wouldn't know what I was saying, right? But basically what we're trying to do here is I've got my root mass here. I've got this free space underneath this piece here. I want to pull in this deadwood inside of the new container to expand the base and increase the stability of the tree, okay? So I know I want to get that done. That means I can push up here. I don't have much of a limitation here. This, this to me is very, very easy to work. There's no, there's no concern about this, okay? This is the real immediate area. So coming in here and just starting to work that away, not having done any damage to any other portion of the root system, I've automatically given myself the chance for success. Now what happens if I start working in this area and all of a sudden I start to see, ooh, there's a lot of really important roots here. I can't cut them off. They're not gonna be mobile. I can't move them. I can't sculpt this root system. What do I do now? Now what do I do? My whole plan, right? I just, I just walked you through this whole strategy and all of a sudden I start breaking down the roots and I'm saying, it's not gonna work. Do I abandon it? Do I change the design of the tree? Let's sphagnum, build it up with sphagnum. Definitely build it up with sphagnum, right? Okay, now I move to the second operation because when we start to test out our greatest limitation, okay, this upper portion being our greatest limitation, if I start working this and I recognize I'm not going to be able to reduce this, then I automatically shift, okay? That limitation is real. It exists. I acknowledge it. Now let's move to the next area we can change the aesthetic. So if we start to think about this, okay, I'm going to have this kind of built up back here. I can make that look believable. I can make that look real. Have you ever seen all of the semi-cascading trees in Japan that have these kind of exposed roots or it looks like the tree's up on a mound of moss and age? And You know that that's all because they took a tree that was upright and dumped it over, right? And that created that very natural aesthetic. Okay, so over the course of time, this area that has this root system here if we work it correctly, and we handle it, and we water it correctly, and we manage the roots, this can exist right here as it stands now and be completely believable as a natural addition to the tree. And in fact, it can actually enhance the aesthetic of the tree. So knowing that, I don't have to be afraid of anything. If I get in here and there's, a, there's no ability to reduce that, okay, that's fine. Where do I go next after that, though? If I have a limitation here, where do I go next? How do I pivot? How do I stay on track to still get it into the container that I want it to be in and not bear root and leave some portion untouched? I move to my next limitation, right? So we said, listen, if this is reducible, I probably don't have to work the bottom of the root system. But if I can't reduce this, now I'm definitely gonna reduce the bottom of the root system, okay? Because now I can pull up to that and again, change the elevation from here to here. If I can't go from here to here, then I'm gonna go from here to here, and I'm gonna reduce from that portion of the root system. I can leave this portion untouched, I've explored it, maybe it's reducible, but if it's not, great. I'm gonna reduce that next limitation, I'm gonna make this aesthetically pleasing, and I still have that portion that's untouched, not bare-rooted, and giving the tree the chance to reproduce a root system. Success, survival, is never a question. It's never a question in the repotting process. It's a matter of how do you roll with and manipulate the aesthetic of bonsai. And this is where we get to this big fundamental point that because the root system and this shallow container is what makes bonsai different than a plant in a pot, we have to be able to sculpt this root system with the same capacity to roll with the punches and adapt to what the tree gives us as we do up here. But if we don't have that system, we know here, if I bend and I bend and I bend and I see that branch start to tear, that's my limitation. I can't bend any further. Okay, cool, I accept that. If we reduce and we reduce and we reduce and we start to hit big thick roots that we can't reduce anymore, that's my limitation. This is the same discussion of sculpting the two systems of the tree, right? Branching we understand very well, 
root systems, nobody ever talks about it. Yet it's the most important thing that we do. So if I could leave you with one thing today, it's not that you should believe in my system, right? This is how you repot, believe me. But it would be establish your own system. Establish your belief of what you're trying to accomplish in the repotting process because that creates the boundary and the guidelines for everything that you do in the handling of the root system. If you don't have that, you're flying blind. You have no ability to draw a boundary of where it's safe and where it's dangerous or where to start and where to finish. So number one, establish your ethos or your, what you're trying to accomplish in the repotting process. This is imperative. This is paramount. Okay? Number two, whenever we're repotting, always understand that if you have a portion that is still intact, maintaining all of the biology, maintaining a point where the new root system can emerge from, you are giving the tree the best chance of success in that operation. This is how we protect a tree in the manipulation and sculpting of the root system. We never want to bare root a tree if we're pushing the limits of what it can tolerate horticulturally. Okay? So we're developing our system. We're always leaving some portion untouched in that system. And we want to be working with those concepts of the limitations and the reduction of those limitations in a disciplined, systematic fashion to accomplish what we set out to accomplish. Does that make sense? So no matter what happens, when I approach this tree in the repotting process, because I have that strategy of the repotting process, I don't have to worry about it surviving, and I'll be able to be adaptable to what the tree gives me to reduce the limitations that it presents me and still achieve what I set out to accomplish. This is bonsai repotting on a higher level. You guys have any questions? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, when I start working this upper system, because you can see the attachment of the root system right here, which, which again, it does, this, this matters very little to me, uh, that there are roots occurring from this location. And this is the live vein. Live vein drops in here. There's obviously roots attached here. There's some roots attached here. I have to reduce this system in order to be able to get this into the container that I want. So when I'm doing that, the question is, how, how far do you go? Do you try to get roots to grow lower down to replace this root or something of that nature? And here's, here's what we know. Each species of tree has a different capacity to generate roots, replace roots, maybe reestablish a root mass. And what we know of with junipers is that junipers are kind of set in terms of where their roots exist. I know I have a root here that attaches to this vascular transport. I know I have a root here that attaches to this vascular transport. Those roots aren't going to change. I'm not going to get a root to grow out of some mystical portion of the living vein. The only reason this living vein is alive on this side is because this root exists right here. If I take that off, there's no root that's going to attach itself to that living vein and take care of that transport for me. That's why there's dead wood and there's living veins completely separated in junipers. As a result, I have to keep that alive. I got to keep that intact. So what I can do is I can start to remove the roots on the upper side of this. And I can start to focus the energy of all of the trees, sugars, and starches from photosynthesis into the roots that exist below the top of that root mass. And I can start to direct their growth by focusing that energy on the roots that I leave behind. And that is how, over the course of time, I would begin to manipulate and sculpt that root system. Yeah. Any other questions? Would I also not bear root a deciduous? I would bear root a deciduous tree. And this is where you see the big difference between a conifer and a deciduous. Because a conifer, when you think about a conifer, and even when we're talking about a larch, which is a deciduous conifer, which starts to walk the line of conifer, and you know, it's like one of those middle, what do we do now kind of a thing, bald cypress, Don Redwood, these are two others. Okay, when you start to talk about that, in a conifer, they depend on microbial relationships. They have foliage year round they move water much less efficiently than a deciduous tree does. And as a result, they cannot reproduce tissue as rapidly. That's why they depend on that microbial activity. So with a deciduous tree, knowing that they have rapid, efficient water movement, I would happily bear root a deciduous tree, but I would not do it every time I repot. Yep. Once you start to establish a refined deciduous tree, heavy twigginess, a dependency on that water transport to keep all of those smaller, finer portions of the tree alive, you have to be more careful with the root system. <laughs>